Good morning, is this on? Okay. Uh, as Joel said, uh, I work here at the museum and uh, most of what I do is talk to visitors about STEM. And I think that uh, this museum, us as a society, we, we have a major problem. Understanding STEM is tough. It's a difficult concept, science, technology, engineering, and math. Do we have any people in the audience in those professions? Your schoolwork, your homework was probably really tough, right? <laughs> so every day I come to work, I have that challenge. Make STEM accessible. Um, did anybody have a chance to answer the question on your name tag? OK, how many of you answered that question in the positive? OK, so not quite half of the room. And unfortunately, that's probably the case with a lot of our visitors. We have to get people excited about STEM disciplines. And to do that, one of the things we do is we introduce interesting design concepts and creative programs that help make STEM a little more accessible to them, to our normal visitors. Now, I'm going to use some note cards. Anybody have a problem with that? <laughs> Just to stay on track, because I do like to talk. So Maureen already de described or defined what STEM was. And as I said, we integrate art, or when I say art, so the A in STEAM is, stands for the arts. But when I say arts, I, I'm talking about a broad range of the creative arts. So, uh, visual and graphic design, drama, music, uh, other uh, sounds, other, other uh, senses that we might uh, use on a regular basis but not necessarily uh, think we'd be using in a museum about technology. And I think that is important to our visitors. They're, they're not often expecting those types of experiences or these types of surroundings. And I think we've, as a museum, have really started doing a good job about that. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, how we bring the arts, the creative arts, design elements into not only our exhibitions, but our programs, the way we connect with people, things like that. One thing I thought I would do in advance is I thought I would talk or show you an example, an up-close example of one way that we creatively talk about a STEM concept. Now, we have astronauts here at the museum all the time. And what do you think the number one question an astronaut gets asked when they come to the museum? What was this one? How do they use the bathroom in space? It is the number one question <laughs> astronauts get asked. Not just when they come to the museum, but when they go to dinner parties. So it's, it's an uh, idea that our visitors are interested in. It's an idea that our visitors can relate to. Everybody goes to the bathroom. Okay. So we decided to take a creative route to teach what we earthbound uh, individuals might think is a fairly simple concept, going to the bathroom. Most of us learned how to go to the bathroom, at least by their teens, right? <laughs> so we think it's a, a fairly simple concept, but in the microgravity environment of space, you would be wrong. It's not terribly 
you know, easy to go to the bathroom in space. It's not terribly easy to make it a simple process. So what we decided to do is we decided to get people up close and personal to the concept of going to the bathroom in space. And we decided to have a shuttle toilet made for us. This is a reproduction. This has never flown in space. It's never been used by an astronaut to go to the bathroom in space. It is used purely for educational purposes. But people are not expecting to see something like this when they come to the museum. I don't think my remote's working again. Oh, here we go. Oh, by the way, let me just point out the drawing up there. That was drawn by one of the uh, educators here in the museum. Um, but people aren't expecting to get up and close to something like this. And we think it sets a unique tone for our visitors. They can actually touch this. This actually works. It generates a vacuum that, if it was used to go to the bathroom, would move the liquid or solid waste. We call it number one and number two here at the museum. I actually did an evaluation, and because we have a lot of uh, international visitors, so I wanted to think of some ways to, uh, you know, speak about fecal matter and uh, liquid waste urine in a, uh, I guess, a friendlier, more social way. So I tested, do our visitors, national and international, do they understand what we mean when we say number one and number two? I was shocked that the majority of our visitors, more than 90% of those people evaluated, and I evaluated more than 100 people from lots of different countries, they understood what number one and number two meant. That, that was actually surprising to me. So we do use the term number one and number two. But this is a unique instrument. And this was made available to us by the company that developed this mock-up of the midsection. And when we're not using it as an educational device, it actually sits inside the mock-up in its actual space where it would be on the shuttle. So when we're not using it as an educational uh, object, people can see it in the mid-deck and they can visualize what it would have been like for astronauts to go to the bathroom in space. Now I was told that I could talk for 30 or 40 minutes about the toilet and you all would be fine about <laughs> that, right? I could go on and on about this. I, I developed the program that we use to teach people about the toilet. And I have to say, one of you, you get cool experiences. You're exposed to cool experiences working here at the museum. About a year or so ago, I got to reteach a shuttle astronaut how to use the shuttle toilet, because that shuttle astronaut was going to be here for a congressional night and was going to talk to congressional staffers about going to the bathroom in space. And he hadn't been on the shuttle, hadn't used one of these since 1985. So that was kind of really cool, teaching an astronaut how to use the shuttle toilet. And they do spend hours learning how to use the shuttle toilet. Like I said, it's much more complicated than you think. But this is just one of the devices we use. I'm just going to set my note cards on the toilet. and see if I can get the slides to move. OK, so how did I get here? Uh, it's been an interesting path for me. I, I have to say, first off, it, Joel said he was uh, an air and space uh, nerd. I am a science and museum geek, OK? I, I admit it. You know, my wife just, sh all she hears is the Charlie Brown adult, you know, when I talk about you know, whatever's going on, how I try to explain to her the scientific concept of something that's happening, you know, a, a lunar eclipse or whatever. But that's what I enjoy. I grew up loving science. I was always interested in science. I, I liked to mix chemicals and blow things up. 
I took apart just about every small appliance that uh, my mom had in the house. Uh, I, I wasn't so good at putting them back together, which is probably why I didn't become an engineer. Uh, I peppered her with all kinds of questions about, you know, why dogs bark or, you know, why airplanes fly. That was a good question to ask. Uh, or, uh, you know, why pop uh, bubbled. If you don't know, pop is the term we use in the Midwest for soda. I am from the Midwest. Um, so I peppered her with all kinds of questions. Uh, my only regret now that I work here at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum is that my mom didn't live to see me work at the Smithsonian. I think she would have been okay with all of the broken appliances and uh, the endless string of questions if she were to see you know, where I'm at today. Because this is an amazing, amazing place to work. Uh, but before here, I did a lot of education. I spent most of my career, most of my adult life, in informal uh, learning environments. I worked at a couple of zoos. I worked at a very small zoo in Coal Valley, Illinois. Anybody from Coal Valley? No? Anybody from Illinois? OK, I see a couple of hands. Uh, well, Niobe Park Zoo was where I first started working in an environmental or in an informal environment. And I started working there as a high school student. I worked there uh, on weekends and uh, summers. And I got to teach. I started working there taking care of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the animals in the petting zoo. Then I started educating people about, or teaching people about the animals in the petting zoo. And that really got me interested. Not only was I able to learn to study science, in this case, animal behavior and things like that, but I could also share that information with visitors to the zoo. So that kind of got me hooked. Niobe Park Zoo. It's actually a wonderful zoo now. It's much uh, newer now and much bigger now. Uh, from there, I went to Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay. Anybody been to Bush Gardens in Tampa? OK. Did you know they have a zoo? Yeah, most people go there for the rides. But they have a world-class zoo. In fact, it's the fourth largest zoo in the country. And I taught people about animals there. After that, I graduated from college with a degree in zoology, surprisingly enough and a uh, degree in mathematics. And I went to work at the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa. And that's really where I cultivated my, my jack of all trades, as far as science goes. Uh, I haven't really used zoology in quite a while since I worked at Bush Gardens. But I have become good at lots of different sciences including aerospace engineering, which I teach here. Uh, but I spent several years at the Museum of Science and Industry as the extended programs manager. And I brought in school groups from all over the country to the Museum of Science and Industry. And we taught them about many different things. From there, I went to the Orlando Science Center. So I didn't move too far. I spent a few years there at the Orlando Science Center as the director of lifelong learning. So I was responsible for developing all of the programs that the education department uh, uh, created and offered to the general public. After the Orlando Science Center, I had a few years at the National Museum of American History, one of the Smithsonian museums. Anybody been there? OK, good. And I worked in the Hands-On Science Center. How many knew that the National Museum of American, Indus uh, American Industry? American History. How many people knew that it had a Hands-On Science Center? One person. You've raised your hand with every question. OK. There's <laughs> a ringer. Um, yeah, so we did science. We did science related to American history. And I developed a lot of the science programs that we did in the Hands-On Science Center. And that was my uh, uh, first foray into, Smith, into the Smithsonian world. After that, of course, I came to the uh, Air and Space Museum, where I had to learn an awful lot, awful quickly, about uh, airplanes, how airplanes fly, how rockets fly, 
and lots of other aerospace engineering and science related concepts. And again, it was pretty difficult. I mean, we teach very complicated concepts here at the museum. And it's very difficult for people who come to the museum, especially if they're only spending two hours or so at the museum, to understand those concepts fully. No? Oh. It worked too fast for me. OK, wait. There we go. So how many of you have been to the museum before? This museum? Oh, quite a few of you. How many have been here in the last year? Fewer. How many have been here in the last year and you weren't acting as a tour guide? OK, so you just came here for pleasure. Okay, well. Like most of our visitors, that's, that's what they do. I mean, we are one of the museums that every eighth grade class has to come see when they come to Washington, D.C. Our visitors are interested in air and space. Some aren't. Some are just checking items, objects off the list. OK, saw the Spirit of St. Louis, saw the right flyer. Uh, they come with different motivations for being here. They come with different histories and experiences. They're, they're young. They're old. They're local. They come from national and international destinations. So we've got a lot of work to try to connect with all of those different personalities and experiences and engaging them in science concepts. Like I said, it, it's, a, it's a tough job. How do our visitors learn? We're always wondering that. We're always wondering how do we engage them? How do we connect with them? So we use a lot of uh, learning theories here at the museum. Anybody ever heard of multiple intelligences? OK. Well, we consider uh, extrinsic uh, versus intrinsic motivations. Uh, we, we scaffold a lot of our programs. Uh, the Smithsonian has developed uh, a new way in which we're looking at people's interests. It's called IPOP. Anybody heard of IPOP? I know some of our staff have probably heard about it. But it takes into consideration visitors' interests in, say, ideas, or people, or objects, or the physical. And it takes into consideration all of those interests when we're trying to design an exhibition like the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery or developing an educational program like some of the programs you got to experience today. And when we get that correct, I'm going backwards here, I think. Ooh. OK. And when we get that correct, when we put all of those learning theories into practice, how do we engage the visitors? We do it several different ways. Uh, first, we develop creative environments. So you're sitting in a creative environment right now. I think this Moving Beyond Earth exhibition is pretty amazing, don't you? I mean, it gives me the feel of being in space. And it's very difficult to get people to feel like they're in a microgravity environment. Although we have at, had visitors ask us where the microgravity room was. I think there are some visitor services folks here that can attest to that. So we develop unique environments. I have a few of the unique environments that we've developed, including the Moving Beyond Earth, on the screen. Top left is our Pioneers of Flight. These are all fairly new exhibitions where we've really, really started to to hone our skills at, you know, including design concepts in the, uh, the development of exhibitions. So Pioneers of Flight, we have an area inside there where a lot of the uh, ideas are presented in uh, environments where you would see, naturally see the artifacts. Um, so we have a, a dock in there, and we've put artifacts in the dock. 
We've got an area for uh, early childhood development where we do a lot of puppet shows and story times. All of these things are created in the exhibition, not as an afterthought, but before the exhibit opened up. In addition, we, we use other environments and other uh, design concepts. Uh, the bottom right-hand corner, you can see, this is the exhibition right above us, Time and Navigation. There is a lot of uh, setting that was developed inside there. There's a ship inside Time and Navigation that's wonderful. And again, inside that ship, we've put a lot of artifacts, just like the mid-deck over here where we've housed a lot of artifacts. We could just put them in a glass case, but, but why? You know, let's make people feel like they're in a special place. Let's get them thinking creatively. Let's put our artifacts on display creatively. Um, the one thing I like in time and navigation is we talk about the concept of time and navigation by using actors. So if you get a chance after we're done here this morning, if you go up to Time and Navigation and sit there and watch it, this is like a little movie. And we have actors talking to each other about the importance of uh, navigational instruments and the use of time in navigation. And it's, it's quite informative. One of the things that I've been talking about that we do an awful lot, and I'm going to focus on the How Things Fly gallery because that's what I do. I teach people about how things fly. And I was heavily involved in the design of how things fly, the redesign of how things fly, I should say. I'm going to talk about some of the design elements that we have in how things fly. Did anybody get a chance to go into how things fly? Great. Not as many as I would have liked, but maybe on your way out you can stop in. It is our premier hands-on exhibition. So it's very light on artifacts, but it is heavy on hands-on. And the success of that gallery has actually led us to rethink the way we do exhibitions. You'll notice there are a lot of things in here that are hands-on. Well, that's because of the success of the How Things Fly Gallery, which opened in 1996. But if you had gone in there, you might have noticed some of the design elements that we used in the gallery. Uh, there's a big 747, looks like it's tie-dyed on the south wall of How Things Fly. It's a beautiful work of art. You know, it's, it's gorgeous, it's really big, it takes up most of the south wall. But it's not just a pretty picture. It actually helps explain pressure changes on aircraft in flight. All of those different colored lines that you see on the 747 here in this image or on the real thing are actually different air pressure along the entire surface of the aircraft. And using design to help explain that difficult concept that there can be a variety of air pressure along one surface, one continuous surface, has helped. In addition, we've used graphic panels, brightly colored graphic panels in the uh, exhibition not just to help with wayfinding, but to help people consciously or unconsciously realize they were in a different uh, STEM concept, that we were now talking about a different idea. We also use wind socks. These are actual wind socks that you would find at an airport, maybe your local airport. And those wind socks also help with wayfinding and uh, differentiating between different STEM concepts. And probably one of my favorite features in How Things Fly are the uh, runway markings. Now be honest, did anybody run up the runway markings with your arms outstretched? <laughs> because on a daily basis, I see kids doing that. Now security yells at them because it's a tripping hazard, <laughs> but I don't. I think it's pretty cool. The runway markings help inform our visitors about the different uh, way runways are marked. So if a child or an adult is taxiing down the runway, they can turn to their neighbor, whether they know them or not, and bore them about the markings on the runway. 
but it is another way that we are engaging visitors about difficult concepts. I also like it because it's a unique, a very unique way to use space that we hardly ever use in this museum. Most museums don't use the floor very often. And I think it makes it look really cool. <laughs> and we've done that in other places within, within how things fly, the runway markings. And the runway markings are absolutely accurate, meaning that the numbers you see on the runways and the markings you see on them would be representative of runways facing in those directions. So we have done our due diligence in this. Maybe I'm not pointing this in the right direction. I was hoping to have the design hanger finished for you all. But unfortunately, it was supposed to open two weeks ago, but uh, we've run into some problems with the construction of the design hanger, and it's not open. But you hopefully got a chance to at least do or see one of the activities that we'll probably be doing inside the design hangar. Did anybody build a paper airplane and launch it? Man, you guys missed out. That launcher can launch paper airplanes up to 50, 60 miles an hour. It's really cool. It was cool, wasn't it? Yeah. So that activity, well, let, me, let me explain what the design hangar is. Anybody want to shout out a, an idea of what they think the design hangar is? Excellent. <laughs> Have you all ever heard of maker spaces? OK, well, this is primarily going to be a maker space with a, with a little twist. We're going to pose challenges, design challenges, in this makerspace. We're not going to have any constraints on how they meet these design challenges or whether or not they can meet them. But we are going to allow visitors to make things, to attempt to complete these design challenges. So in fact, they may be asked to build a paper airplane that can fly a really long distance or do loop-de-loops. We'll give them all kinds of materials. So would you build your paper airplane out of? Just regular paper? Regular paper. But we might provide tissue paper, aluminum foil. We'll provide tape. We'll allow them to create their own design. And that's important because they're not just learning about the concept. They are actually engaged in creative thinking. They're using critical thinking to solve these problems. They're asking themselves, if I use tissue paper and the launcher launches my airplane at 50 miles an hour, is my tissue paper paper airplane going to hold up? Probably not. Okay, So they'll be challenged to think in different ways, take into consideration the environment that they're working in. What do they need to do to be successful? We'll also encourage them to collaborate with each other. That's a lot of things that uh, businesses wish people coming into you know, their, the work uh, world would have more experience in, collaborating with uh, fellow staff members. Well, we're going to encourage collaboration in the design hangar. And since a lot of you didn't get to see Oh, real quick, so this is another challenge that I'm showing on the screen here. We ha I have built a vertical wind tunnel, so it's got a stream of air that shoots up. And we ask visitors to, get, uh, to build a ve vehicle, again, made out of whatever they think will work, to sit in that airstream for a certain length of time. It is much, much harder than you would think. We also ask, challenge them to get their object to a certain height within that airstream. And as I said, it, it is pretty challenging. But we have visitors. We did an evaluation of this, specifically on the vertical wind tunnel uh, design challenge. Visitors spent, on average, 32 minutes at this challenge. 
We've done evaluations about how people spend time in our museum. And on average, people spend less than 10 minutes in our exhibitions. People spend almost two and a half times more time in how things slide because of its hands-on nature. But people are spending more, on average, than 30 minutes at this one design challenge. I'd say thus far, it's fairly successful. We're challenging people to complete these design challenges and they don't want to leave until they're successful. Here's an example since you didn't get to see or launch a paper airplane. It's quick so you have to pay attention. Like I said, this thing launches it. That's our uh, paper airplane launcher. This thing launches it very quickly. Here we're asking them to hit a specific target. So we want them to build a stable paper aircraft because they have to be able to control where it goes. This uh, young man is actually pretty good at it. Let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, it's in slow motion. He nails the center hula hoop right down the middle. Now, do we just let him go after that? No, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we just said, hey, great job, next. In this instance, we challenged him to develop the, pa the same paper airplane design with different materials to see how the paper airplane would then react with those different materials. And he did do that. And his next flight wasn't successful. So he did learn something about materials in this instance. Uh, the design hangar will probably open up, I should mention this, probably sometime at the beginning of January. Fingers crossed. In addition to creative exhibitions and creative spaces within those exhibitions, the education department does a lot of planning for creative programs. I've just got a few examples of what we offer to the general public. Uh, we, we bring in dancers. And we, we relate that to STEM concepts. We relate that to cultural concepts. But again, it's one of those activities or opportunities that a visitor coming to the National Air and Space Museum would not be thinking about when they come in here. Uh, we have kite flying inside the museum. Now you may think, okay, well I would expect to see kites in the museum, but kite flying or kite dancing? We do kite dancing in the museum. We also do musical performances. Anybody see the, uh, the video of the United States Air Force Band at the Udvarhazy Center? Was that not inspirational? I kind of teared up. I, I think maybe there was dust in the museum that day or something, but I kind of teared up. But it brought out an emotion in me that I wasn't expecting standing around all of those artifacts. We use music quite often in our family days. And it's just another way in which we engage our visitors about scientific concepts. And of course, hands-on demonstrations and programs. So you did a bunch of object-based hands-on programs out there. And those are really, really crucial in helping visitors understand these complicated concepts. Our hands-on programming first started in the How Things Fly gallery, of course, where today we still do hands-on demonstrations about the forces of flight. We do a paper airplane contest daily in there. We talk about the Wright brothers. We've made the story of the Wright brothers a hands-on program where people can put themselves in the place of the Wright brothers and try to figure out how the Wright brothers overcame all of those obstacles to build the first sustained powered and controlled aircraft. And our hands-on demonstrations are very popular. And I know you already applauded for our explainers, but I, I can't go through today without saying how excellent our explainer core is. As Maureen said, they're made up of high school and college kids, and they spend hundreds of hours learning 
all of these complicated STEM concepts, hundreds of hours before we put them out there, bless you, in front of the audience, in front of uh, visitors. And they do a wonderful job, don't they? I've taken uh, groups of teachers to a discovery station like you did this morning. And the explainer has done the discovery station, brought out all kinds of objects, engaged the visitors for several minutes, and then I've left with the teachers. These are all science teachers. And I've asked them, what do you think that uh, person does for a living? And they said, oh, well, obviously they're in education, probably a high school science teacher. I'm like, well, you're partly right. They're in high school. <laughs> but they're a high school student, not teacher. That's the kind of phenomenal job that they do that, in helping us engage our visitors. Some other ways we do creative programs. Like I said, we use drama. We bring in actors to portray famous historical people. Uh, Phoebe Waterman Haas, Galileo. Galileo never looked so good. He was under house arrest, but we got him out for this. We develop theatrical programs. So you can see we bring in actors to, to do actual science theater. We've done science theater from this stage where we talk about being a, an engineer on the shuttle program and what it took to design, engineer the shuttle. And we get the, the, the kids in the audience to be part of that experience. And we do puppet shows. Now, puppets make me a little nervous. I don't know about you, but <laughs> our audience loves puppets. In fact, I think our director loves puppets. The puppets do a wonderful job of getting kids excited, again, about the, a very complicated topic. And so we do them quite often. Actually, the woman in charge of our puppet program just walked in. She's also the person who drew that astronaut on the toilet. Let's give Diane a hand. But that's my challenge on a daily basis, is developing these creative programs to engage visitors. It's my job on a daily ba basis to train the explainers, to educate the explainers so they can go out and engage our visitors. It's a challenge that I, you know, sometimes it's more difficult than uh, others, but uh, it is incredibly fulfilling. Let's see, I'm, okay. Let's not forget our virtual visitors. We get seven to 10 million visitors at the museum, physical space, annually. But we get many more than that virtually. So we can't ignore the virtual visitor when it comes to introducing the A into STEM and providing them with STEAM experiences. The How Things Fly website is a perfect example. Now this is our new, one of our newest websites that uh, are related to the National Air and Space Museum. And I was heavily involved in the development of the website. And I do have to say that the American Alliance of Museums did award the How Things Fly website with an award for online presence. That was in 2012. So it's, it's only been up for a couple of years. But we had a big challenge. You know, we, we couldn't, we, we couldn't physically interact with our visitors. We had to use a website to, to uh, foster the same experiences that, that an incredibly hands-on website does. And that was a challenge. But I think we were successful. We included uh, design and uh, visual graphic elements in the development of the website. There are simple and fairly complex computer activities that visitors can do. So you can uh, change the diameter of uh, uh, a tube to see how fluid pressure changes over the uh, length of that tube. Or you can test fly an F4U World War II Corsair to see how control surfaces work. Or you can build a 
sort of a chimera of an aircraft combining historically uh, uh, historic parts of historic aircraft to build one aircraft to fly to a diff to a specific height or a specific speed, and we feel that the the website has been incredibly incredibly uh, popular. In fact, there's one design element of the website that was more successful than I ever dreamed possible, and again, it's because of the explainers. Part of that uh, website is called Ask an Explainer, and it allows visitors to submit questions related to air and space topics to our explainers, our high school and college age explainers. And these explainers research the information for the visitor, they engage with industry engineers and business professionals and curators to figure out the answers. So we're not only helping inform the visitor, the virtual visitor, but we're actually training explainers on how to do research, how to write, things like that. And that information that visitors submit to ask an explainer helps build the content of the website. So on a daily basis, the content of the website grows because of the help of our visitors. And it has been incredibly, incredibly popular. We weren't sure how many people would submit questions to this website. And it turns out that we receive several hundred questions a year through the website. It's, it's actually more than we were set up to handle, but I think we're getting, getting a grasp on it. The creative team. So who helps make this possible? Well, I have to give a hand out to the, the designers, the, the physical designers and the virtual designers. Those folks that help the educators, the curators, and the conservationists develop these wonderful exhibits, they're a key to the success of all of our exhibitions and our programs. Without these designers, it, it wouldn't be possible, or it would be much more difficult to introduce the concepts of the arts into uh, our STEM programming. They are amazingly talented people. Are any of the, uh, the designers still in the building, in the room? Raise your hand. <laughs> Jennifer Carlton. I scared the others away. They are amazingly, amazingly talented people. So I hope if you get a chance after this, you go through the museum and look at some of the design concepts that they've introduced. I think you probably would be able to tell some of our newer exhibitions from some of our original ex exhibitions that uh, populated the museum in the 70s, easily. Of course, some of our uh, designers get a little uh, overboard on their designs. That's my office in the upper left-hand corner. And yes, that's a space shuttle in my office. To this day, I have no idea how the creative types got the space shuttle in my office, but I walked in one morning, and that space shuttle's about uh, 12 feet long with a, about a uh, uh, seven to eight foot uh, wingspan. My door's only about that big. And there it was, sitting in my office. It's now a cooler. But they are amazing, amazing people. So why do we do this? Well, many famous scientists believe that art is incredible, incredibly important. I believe it was, uh, yeah, Einstein said that the greatest scientists are also artists. Business leaders nowadays feel that art or the creative arts are important in their business. There's a quote from uh, Jim McNerney, the uh, CEO and chairman of Boeing. He believes in teaching the creative arts. He believes that it improves critical thinking and problem-solving skills. 
We believe the same thing here. Next generation science standards. It's important in the next generation science standards that students be able to model systems. Well, the creative arts help students improve their ability to model natural and physical systems. And of course, we believe that the natural and the physical world are made much more accessible, they're, they're much closer when we introduce the concept of the arts, when we allow people to explore those concepts with the arts. And that's why we do what we do. That's one reason why I get up every day and come to the work with a smile on my face. It's not just the spirit of St. Louis hanging over my head or the Colum uh, Columbia uh, Apollo 11 module, command module, that's sitting there in front of me as I walk in the door every day. But it's the ability to engage visitors. And if on a single day I can see that spark of recognition, that aha moment in a person's eyes, it's all worth it to me. And that's why we do it. All right, so are we going to take uh, some questions? I have three skip questions. I know people have to go. Oh. Hello? Yeah, yeah. But um, if you want to talk to Michael after the talk, first, let's give Michael a Sitting huge right hand.